Well, welcome to N3Con 2020. This is our 10th edition of the New Now Next Media Conference hosted by the Asia Chapter of the Asian American Journalists Association. I'm Wan Ha, the Asia Chapter President and also a Bloomberg reporter here in Hong Kong. This is our first ever all digital conference. Now you may be joining us from your bedroom or your kitchen table, or if you're lucky enough, a home office. But know this, that by being here today and over the next few days, you are part of a unique, diverse, and incredible community of journalists. We are here to support each other, and we are here to foster great journalism. We have with us this weekend more than 400 attendees from 18 countries. They're going to be jumping in and out of these sessions, and I really encourage you to connect with each other in these discussions on our Facebook group and, our, and on our YAP conference app. Now, for many of us, AJA is family. That's certainly the case for me. I've been, AJA has been a part of my life since I was a college student. And whether you're joining us for the 10th time, and there are a couple of us out there who are, or for the very first time at your very first N3Con, we welcome you. And we invite you to really engage with fellow attendees this weekend and explore how AAJA can be a part of your family too. Now this entire four days of programming was put on by an amazing team of volunteers. They've worked day and night and on weekends to put this programming together. And they do it because they, because we, this community, we are all passionate about AJA, about this unique and diverse community and what we can offer to each other. That is what's special about AJA. Now, a special shout out to Mike Ramanachai and Karina Lee and the entire broadcast production team. They're making this possible today. They're behind the scenes, but they really are the nerve center of what makes this work. And Selena Cheng and all of our fabulous volunteers. We've got a jam packed three days. So please check Facebook and yeah for announcements. Just a few quick reminders before we start. Uh, please mute your mic unless you're speaking. To panelists, please be aware that these sessions are on the record and most are being recorded and can be watched on replay. We encourage you to tweet, post on Facebook and other social media. Please hashtag EntryCon2020 and AJA-Asia. Now let's kick off EntryCon's exploration of the new front lines. Our theme this year with our very first plenary on how the US China tug of war is reshaping Asia. Please join me in a big virtual welcome for our panelists and our moderator, Jody Schneider. She actually happens to be sitting here next to me. Jody is a senior international editor at Bloomberg here in Hong Kong. She's also the president of the Foreign Correspondents Club here in the city. Jody. Morning, everybody. Very pleased to be with you and to uh, kick off this panel. Uh, I will briefly introduce the panelists, and uh, then we will get right. We will start get started right away, as we only have an hour, and we get uh, uh, There will be uh, opportunities to ask questions, so please send them in. Um, is there, should I remind them how to do that? Okay, do it through Facebook, and please send us questions, and we'll try to get to all of them. So, uh, join me in welcoming our panel. Uh, they include on your screen. You will you will see them. Um, we'll start with uh, Olivia Ashan, who's the uh, chief U.S. correspondent for uh, Kachin Media. We have um, Shaheen Zeng, who's the correspondent for BBC World Service, based in Washington D.C. So joining us in her evening, we appreciate that. Uh, Josh Chin, who's a reporter for the Wall Street Journal, and Kevin Kralicki, who is. Uh, the Asian news editor for Reuters. So thank you all for joining us and um, lovely art on your home uh, office walls, by the way. <laughs> so thank you, and a nice plant there. Um, so I'll start right away as we only have an hour. Uh, first, where do we see the state of play in China-US tensions right now? Uh, President Trump in the next hour is about to give his speech, uh, accepting the nomination of his party for re-election, and we may well hear about China in that speech. Uh, on the one hand, there have been escalating tensions almost daily around topics such as Huawei and other technology issues like TikTok, Hong Kong, the imposition of the national security law, human rights issues like the treatment of the Uyghurs and the origins of the virus. Uh, President Trump is clearly running on tough actions and tough rhetoric against China and trying to, impose, uh, trying to um, paint his opponent, Joe Biden, as weak on China. But yet, then just this week, trade representatives of both countries said they were aiming to salvage that trade one deal. 
uh, trade phase one, excuse me, trade deal from earlier this year and hoping to boost Chinese purchases of US goods. Where do we stand? And does the Cold War label really apply? Uh, so I'm gonna ask Kevin first uh, to weigh in on this. This is this is your area, this is your beat. Tell us what yeah. we uh, what are we really seeing going on? Well, I should just say, uh, I think at the, at the outset, uh, as a disclaimer, um, I am not a China expert. I've not worked in China. Um, I spent most of my career between Japan and the US. So anything I could offer you today would be based on my perspective as, as a news editor in the region who's looking at uh, the coverage that we produce day in and day out. Um, and if I had personal uh, opinions that were of note or of interest, and that's a doubtful prep, sort of proposition, I'm professionally constrained from sharing with them. But just just to, with, with, with all those caveats out there, I, people are probably getting up to make coffee or walk the dog now. Um, you know, <laughs> you, 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 you mentioned the, the Cold War label and that's clearly, I mean, clearly both sides have invoked that. Um, in fact, uh, you know, uh, Pompeo and his, his recent remarks at the Nixon Library, uh, which are worth a, a read in full, uh, sort of goes beyond a Cold War formulation and says, this isn't trust and verify, the famous Reagan formulation, it's distrust uh, and verify. Um, and, you know, while I'll stipulate to being old, I, I wasn't on a copy desk in 1946, so I can't speak to how that felt. But what's been striking to me, um, again, just speaking from my perspective as, as an editor, is how how quickly um, this has progressed, uh, this has escalated, and how uh, wide ranging uh, the ramifications have been. Um, you know, in some ways, uh, I feel that this is like the, the black hole at the center of our news universe. And almost every story we're writing from Asia, in some ways, um, is kind of in its gravitational field. Good. All right. Well, thank you. And uh, that's a good good perspective, you know, kind of painting this this picture uh, large. Our, our BBC correspondent, I'm particularly interested in your views on this because you have to speak, you have to explain what's happening here uh, to a Western audience, uh, which is not easy in, in this environment. Uh, so well, just tell us about how you perceive all this. Right. So I actually report in both Chinese and English languages, so I'm facing two very different uh, audiences. And um, when it comes to the Cold War label, I personally think it's not very helpful. It might be self-fulfilling prophecy, um, but we all have to admit that the two countries are very much in a state of decoupling. While we're seeing diplomats, journalists being expelled from uh, both countries, and seeing the end of many educational exchanges, which tend to be low-hanging fruit for coll collaboration between the U.S. and China. So some might say we're just one step away from breaking diplomatic ties. And what concerns me the most is the uh, view of average American people or Chinese people towards each other. Um, I think a recent survey found that uh, Americans' view towards China is historically negative, 74% uh, of Americans don't have a good view of China. Um, an American friend of mine who actually recently served in the Peace Corps program in China told me that he felt very surreal that he might be the last generation of American in a long time to be engaged in this kind of very intimate intimacy, um, you know, relationship building with average Chinese people. And he feels upset just hearing Trump saying China virus, which we might hear again in an hour or so, uh, because American fans feel that these Chinese students have nothing to do with this. However, for average Americans, they are watching the top leader saying things like that while not having the real access to average Chinese people. And this might give them an impression that it's okay to say China virus. It's okay to develop a kind of distrust just towards ordinary people in China. We don't have the same, um, you know, statistic in China regarding people's view of the U.S. But I suspect that it's similar. It's uh, also very negative at the moment when nationalism is on the rise in both countries. And are you finding that this perception of the U.S. has gotten markedly um, worse, even 
even recently uh, among the, the uh, people you speak to, particularly as you speak to them in Chinese when they would feel more um, you know, comfortable uh, probably speaking to you than if you were speaking in English? Well, sure, I can see that uh, Chinese people's view towards the U.S. is quickly changing. There's this a part uh, about, uh, you know, the propaganda in China, but also partially because of how the, the tensions have developed between these two countries. I think uh, it's only natural that people would start to develop a very negative view towards each other. And, and rapidly, I mean, are we seeing that? You know, as as um, Kevin was saying, this has all kind of happened very fast. Are you seeing that that negative perception is that that perception is declining uh, rapidly as well? I frankly don't think so. I mean, huh. relationship can be ruined in a very short time, while it takes a much longer time to redevelop it. That's my belief. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, so, Olivia, where, tell us um, how you perceive this uh, from your from your vantage point, and and what your audience is interested in in you covering this. Um, what what kinds of things um, seem to resonate uh, with them? Yeah, sure. So, in terms of the label uh, Cold War, I yeah, I'm also echo what Zhao Yin has said about. I'm reluctant to put any tag on on those things. But because I mainly cover in terms like trade and the tech you, that you both mentioned, it's like very interesting to areas right now where, you know, when you mentioned phase one trade deal, when the two sides, the US, China, are both uh, referring, re reassuring people that this deal will be, uh, you know, respected and implemented. So from in terms like a trade perspective, I think that might be, the very few bright spot in terms of US-China relations. But in terms of tech, as we've seen for the past couple of weeks about, you know, TikTok, WeChat ban, potential ban, um, I don't think we will be, the situation will get any better. And I don't think this will change even though Bi Biden is elected to the president. And on trade, you know, the obvious, I'm going to ask the obvious question, how can you have any kind of trade talks, even on what we know is a limited, this phase one deal was limited, it wasn't a big, you know, uh, trade agreement in the sense of, of, you know, actual moving forward on trade is really about purchasing some goods, right? But mm -hmm. how can you move forward and even have these discussions when, you know, you've got exercises in the South China Sea and you've got you know, all these other things going on and, and Trump, you know, President Trump calling it the kind of virus. How can negotiators sit down and talk at the same time? It seems very odd. Yeah, I mean, we, we have been seeing, you know, efforts from those trade negotiators. They are trying to separate these issues. I think we both hear, both USTR, Rob Heather has said in congressional hearings that he, something like he can't deal with everything about China. He only deals trade with China. And you, even we didn't hear, you know, similar things from Chinese government, but you can see that efforts was trying to se separate those, you know, political things and trade separate. So I think you can see the evidence and how it will go like in the next 90 days before the general election, it remains to be seen. But I can, I think we can definitely see that efforts to separate those things apart. Yeah, that they're still trying to separate them as they had been doing, you know, during last year's negotiations when obviously they made, they made more headway. Good. Well, thank you. And so I'll, I'll turn to, uh, to Doc. Um, Wall Street Journal readers, they're very they're smart about these things. Um, what are you hearing both from your readers and, and what, what is your assessment of uh, where things stand at this very moment, with, you know, uh, ticking down the end of the uh, Republican National Convention? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think, um, I mean, our readers, I mean, they're business focused. And so I think they, they, I mean, they, they naturally have a huge interest in trade. Um, and, and, you know, like everyone else are sort of very curious about where all this is going. I mean, I think there's, you know, there's, there's a sense that we're sort of in really in uncharted waters with this relationship. And, um, you know, I, I was actually one of, there were, there were several American uh, reporters who were expelled uh, from China earlier this year. I was one of them. 
And, uh, you know, just sort of personally, I, you know, after I got expelled, I started thinking back to my first trip to China, which was in 1991, um, which was just two years removed from Tiananmen Square. And I was only 14 at the time, so I wasn't steeped in the, in the geopolitical currents uh, at, at, at that moment. But, but I do remember sort of being unsettled by how few other Americans we saw, you know, it was almost like we weren't supposed to be there. Um, you know, it was just a really tense time. Um, but I also remember how enthusiastic, almost grateful Chinese people were to see us there. Um, I think it's striking to think about, you know, this was one of the worst periods in US-China relations since normalization. Um, no one knew, what, you know, how the relationship was going to evolve, was going to evolve. And, um, you know, but the two governments were still talking. And at a popular level, there was still a lot of kind of mutual curiosity and a sense of sort of possibility. And now, I mean, like, like uh, Jowin and Olivia have said, I mean, we don't really have any of that, right? I mean, the governments aren't really talking except for on trade. Um, and even there, it's barely, you know, they, they barely put a phone call together. Um, and, you know, at the popular level, uh, Jowin mentioned that there was the Pew poll, the, the kind of the worst views of China and the U.S. since like 2005. Um, and in the U.S., I mean, in China, there are, there's sort of no reliable polls, obviously. But, but you know, as an American reporter, you know, just in the last couple of years, you've, you know, I've encountered a lot more suspicion and hostility just from regular people who you're trying to interview, um, who, who just kind of been, you know, who, who, just, who adopted really kind of suspicious views of, of, of American Americans and American journalists. Um, and, you know, I mean, one of the one of the developments that happened recently that, that kind of really brought it home for me was a, a high school exchange program that I took part in in 1993 um, with my with my high school uh, back in the US and, and a Beijing number four high school is, is probably going to be canceled after 27 years, um, which is, you know, I mean, I think it's just a, it's just a symptom of, of where the relationship is. Um, so whether it's a, a new Cold War, I don't know. I mean, I think you know, it has a Cold War sort of feel to it. Um, but, you know, I think the, and the one thing that has happened over the last 30 years is there have been a lot of the U.S. and China have developed a lot of economic ties, which the U.S. and the Soviet Union didn't have during the Cold War. Uh, and even though we're sort of in this decoupling period, I mean, I think there's, those ties still exist. And I think that really changes the equation in terms of kind of global conflict. So I'm not sure that the Cold War is, a, is necessarily a really uh, helpful framework for understanding what this is all about. Well, thank you. And thank you all for, for those assessments. I think uh, so. We won't use Cold War anymore in this then. <laughs> it's an overdone cliche. We'll call it something. Um, but I'm, I'm particularly interested in this caught in the middle sort of situation um, because it seems that, and we have three of you on this, on this screen, and I'll talk about that in a minute and ask about that the caught in the middle. Uh, and we are seeing that, particularly in Hong Kong now, with the number of businesses. Um, between you know individuals here being sanctioned, businesses that used to do business with them, what do they do? Especially U.S. businesses, uh, and now journalists. Um, uh, the FCC, the president has uh, in Hong Kong, has made statements about journalist visas and the concern about uh, journalists uh, how journalist visas may be used, and and we may be caught in that. And three of you. Uh, Sort of are caught in this right now, or have been. Uh, uh, Josh, as you just mentioned, you're in Taiwan now, right? Because you can't work in mainland uh, China or Hong Kong, right? They are uh, not allowed to do that. And both Olivia, as I understand, both Olivia and uh, Shaheen are both um, uh, awaiting uh, their visas to be, um, that their visas have been delayed, correct? That you're not um, been given word on whether they will be renewed. So I'd like for you to all talk a little bit about that, but personally, um, you know, if you are affected, if you are affected, what that means for you, what what that means for coverage, you know, but also how you see this, what what this means for companies, uh, as well as other individuals who are caught in this, and what just the, what implications does that have, both for the future relationship of the country, uh, but also things like trade. And, um, so why don't we start with Olivia, because you're, you're sitting there waiting in the uh, U.S. Yeah, um, yeah. in terms of the visa and restrictions that Johnny and I both are affected, that we are now like in the grace period 
that um, you know, still waiting to hear from the U.S. government. I think how is actually influ- is it just that you know so like uncertainty that you don't know what will happen when this grace period you know ends? Do you have to leave right away, or you can actually uh, file another application? You know, this is all like a legal uh, legal issues that you have to sort out. Um, I think I hear people would talk about like, oh, if Biden, you know, elected, there may be a chance that, you know, he would end this, uh, you know, wall on the journalist front. But I think the question is, how would that, um, how would he, you know, prioritize that? It might be on his agenda, but when will he actually do that? Like it may be even lo- even though he maybe do that say on the first day of his presidency, but that's still like five months away. Seems like a short period of time, but for people who are living through this, five months is a really long period of time. So uh, that's like uh, some uncertainty that you know you just don't know when you will have to move or something. You know, we we have actually joked with U.S. reporters or you know other. Reporters in China, we can exchange furniture, you know, when we both have to move back to their own countries. So this is just uh, some, uh, you know, um, and also, I mean, in terms of like the companies, I mean, I, I, I'm not one of them, but from talk with them, they, they are definitely, I think, you know, um, the business community, especially the in tech expo control front I was, I'm covering, I think the recognize there are some sort of you know national security issues there, but they're definitely they don't agree with that broad ban in terms of um both you know either Huawei or TikTok or WeChat. They wanted to business. They wanted to be you know having that win-win situation and mutual be- benefits. But they they are definitely also another um group of. Uh, you know, entities, individual caught in between as well. So I just, uh, I think, I think right now it's probably a lot of different groups of people feel like they're stuck in between. Um, that's definitely not a good position, a deal position that people want to be in. It must, and it must be difficult to, uh, to, you know, sort of plan for the future and for your organization to plan for the future uh, if you're caught up in this. And, and I know a number of people are. Shaojin, do you want to talk about that from the BBC uh, perspective as well? Uh, sitting there waiting and um, what that means and, and what and how you, you know, uh, how you perceive that, but also what does it mean in terms of uh, implications for, for coverage and on a wider scale that if this was to happen, if the Chinese journalists uh, writ large were not able to stay in the U.S.? Right, I can talk about it from my own perspective. Uh, just like uh, you and Olivia mentioned, uh, many Chinese reporters' visa in the U.S. have expired. At any day, we could be told to pack our bags. So I could very much sympathize with Josh's situation. But by no means, I'm arguing that uh, Chinese reporters in the U.S. are facing the same level of difficulties of uh, foreign reporters in the in China. Well. We in the U.S. were not harassed or followed when we do our reporting. Our interviewees would not be threatened by the state. Uh, however, this new visa rule does target all Chinese nationals rather than Chinese state media representatives. So you have to ask yourself if the economies or Reuters or Financial Times will have issues when they try to hire Chinese nationals in the U.S., a country that respects freedom of speech and freedom of press, I think it should be considered as a red flag. We should maybe all pause for a second and ask ourselves, is there something wrong? And for for journalists, sometimes we seem self-centered when we talk about our own lives, like we're talking about a relatively small group of people. But I see it not only as my personal life, my friends' personal lives, but also a sign for these bilateral relationships, right? Diplomats, journalists, they're usually considered as the relationship builder. We know the two peoples pretty well, but then even we are facing uh, difficulties in, in talking with uh, people on the ground. And and this is another sign of our times that all these uh, people-to-people communication channels are vanishing. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, do you feel um, any anti-Chinese discrimination when you go out and do your reporting, or just in your day-to-day -day life? Do you feel that that has um, that has risen in the U.S. recently, and perhaps since the virus? Um, probably, it's a, a long-running phenomenon, but pretty much uh, more pronounced recently. Um, I won't say it's related to the virus, but it's more related to the political tensions. Um, it will be like a kind of suspicion. For example, I work for the BBC, but I'm a Chinese in the US. So people will have questions like, oh, why are you, why are you working in the US for a British outlet while you are a Chinese? Like, who are you really working for? That's their real question. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so at the same time, um, you know, Chinese audience might be doubting, uh, why did you sell off your soul to a British outlet, to, to the Western media? Why are you betraying your own race? But at the same time, Western audience might be asking questions. Why do we have a Chinese on the BBC again? So you have to have a strong character. <laughs> um, no, I know it's, well, and I wanted to, so back to Josh, you had told us a little bit of your story and obviously, you know, we're, most of us are aware of what happened with uh, the uh, journalists for the, the 12 uh, journalists for the uh, US based publications being kicked out of China. But can you tell us a little bit about um, what this? What do you think this means? Not only for obviously you and, and your publication, but what does this mean for? Um, is this something we should be concerned about? Consumers of information should they be concerned? Big concern. Um, sorry, I think I was muted there. Um, no, I mean I think it's obviously it's a, it's a big concern. Um, anytime uh, you have governments. Um, uh, either kicking out or putting pressure on journalists just because it because of what it means for the flow of information, especially when you're talking about uh, the flow of information between the two largest economies uh, in the world. Um, you know, and I think there's sort of one area where foreign media always falls a little bit short, uh, which is kind of the nuanced stories that humanize China, um, is, like, is the one area that's gotten much harder uh, to, to, to report on, especially for the news organizations like ours that had a large number of, of reporters expelled. So, you know, I mean, the expulsions for us have, have hurt kind of every area of, of coverage inevitably, although with some of them you can do, you can do a, a decent amount of work from outside of China, right? You know, so the hard topics like uh, elite politics and international relations and, and macro like economics and finance, you can kind of you can sort of get by, you can read state media, you can use data, there's ways you can report on those stories. Um, but telling the stories of regular people in China, at least in, a, in an effective way, is, is much more much more challenging now. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a really good point, that um, these are the things that kind of fall by the wayside, and these are the things that um, often can, can really help um, readers you know, international readers understand what's really going on. Um, Kevin, you know, can you talk a little bit about the, the larger sense, um, you know, your your reporters are all, you know, all over Asia here, what uh, being caught in the middle can mean for businesses and the implications that can have, we've seen somewhat on trade, but, but also just um, commercial, uh, implications, and especially during a pandemic where you know, the economy is already bad in many of these countries. Right. Well, I, I would say, you know, first of all, that uh, access to um, access and reporting from the ground is uh, is absolutely always the best. Uh, it's the best. It's the best way to report the news, the kinds of nuanced stories uh, Josh just mentioned. Um, from both sides. And, you know, it's not taking a controversial position at all to say, um, you know, that that has to continue. And we need to see these recent trends reverse. Um, at the same time, even as, as as many of us and, you know, Josh, and Olivia and Joey and are personally kind of caught in the middle, the, the world also, I think, is caught in the middle here. Um, and, you know, it's striking to me that this is shaping the way Australia regulates foreign investment. Um, Ecuador responds to fishing off the Galapagos Islands. Ant Financial thinks about how to structure its IPO. Water use issues in the Mekong Delta. The Wall Street Journal had um, a few weeks back what I thought was an excellent story on how this has reshaped the way 
U.S. universities will, will come back in, in the fall. Um, that was terrific. And so without in any way undermining the case for access at the core, which I think is inviolable, um, I do think there's an opportunity for many reporters to, you know, to, to look at, and, and I, we didn't even talk about or haven't talked much about uh, the supply chain issues and suppliers uh, who are trying to figure this out uh, with a perspective of, you know, beyond uh, January. So um, I think there is a there is a journalistic opportunity for us to kind of report the uh, real world effects of what's happening in the U.S.-China relationship from a number of locations, really from everywhere. I think that, thank you. I think that's really a good point that uh, we, here in Hong Kong, we tend to think, oh, we're caught in the middle, but I think you're, the way you put it is very good. The world in some ways is caught in the middle here and we're seeing it, certainly we're seeing it in a number of Asian countries. So I think that's, uh, that's a really uh, good point. Well, now I want to move away a little bit. Uh, financial press freedom and economic implications are clearly important, but uh, we are now seeing something else. Tensions escalating over the South China Sea. Beijing this week having fired four mass missiles into the waters. Uh, there is the Trump administration took action against Chinese companies that set up outposts in the disputed region. This all seems to be ramping up in a uh, somewhat worrying way on the military front, especially around the South China Sea. How worried do you think we should be about this? And also, um, you know, in the U.S., there's this famous phrase about an October surprise uh, before an election. Um, might this be something that uh, President Trump uh, gives us as an October surprise? Uh, and I hear somebody's dog barking in the background, and that is just so nice. I always Sorry, love it. That's, we that's, have that's my, love that's it my, on the, uh, joining us. It humanizes. That's my dog registering a concern about the South China Sea. <laughs> even, the, even the puppies are, are worried. Um, so um, I'm going to start with uh, with you, Josh. Um, where you know how how concerning is this, and is, is this just a bluster, or um, you know, might we have a whole another set of worries over the next few months? Um, well, I mean, there's, I mean, there's no doubt there's a lot more uh, rattling of sabers uh, going on in the South China Sea um, and around Taiwan. Um, you know, I mean, I think the interesting thing is that, you know, military experts and sort of foreign policy experts always used to say that the potential for military conflict between China and the U.S. was really low precisely because of all these economic links they've built up over the years, right? The, 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 the economic costs of any conflict were far too too great for either country to even really contemplate it in a serious way. Um, now that those links are fraying, I mean, it's sort of naturally the, the risks of conflict seem to be rising. Um, I mean, it's really hard to help you know, how far they're rising. It's hard to say. Um, I mean, one expert at, at RAND and that a colleague of mine talked to recently, sort of, you know, so the risk of a fight breaking out in the Taiwan Strait used to be less than 1%, and now it's climbed up to maybe 2 or 3%. And, you know, uh, that seems really low still. But, I mean, the last few years, I've seen a lot of low probability events come to pass. So, uh, I mean, I think it's, it's definitely a concern. It's something, you know, uh, probably all news organizations are keeping a really close eye on and, and, and should be. Yeah, uh, before I, I ask um, another um member of the panel for their thoughts on this. I wanted to just remind the audience, uh, we only have, we have less than a half hour left and um, if you want to take your questions, please drop your questions uh, to us by commenting on Facebook and in the YouTube comment box. So thank you for that. Um, so Olivia, from your, your perspective, writing out of the US, um, are, is this something that, and, and also let us know from what you're seeing in both um, you know, the Chinese and the uh, the U.S. media, because we don't read everything there when we're over here. Um, is this something people are commenting? Is this a, does this seem to be a growing worry, uh, or, or does it seem to be um, just more posturing from both sides? Yeah, I'm, I'm just not going to comment this on in terms of like uh, in the context of general election, as I just uh, came back from Wilmington, Delaware, where Biden was giving a speech for, you know, DNC, um, where, you know, I spoke, actually, I come across like a group of uh, Trump supporters outside of the venue where Biden was about to speak. And I talked to one of the, one of them told me, you know, that message is about like, you know, he probably can kind of think, you know, I probably Chinese. So 
he just is saying like, I hope this did not offend you, but um, you know, uh, you know, this whole pandemic coronavirus thing is just a plan by Chinese and democratic. And I firmly believe that if Biden, if Trump got reelected, that this virus is going to come back 10 times more, you know, because Biden didn't get elected and that's the revenge. You know, I just think the being tough on China is just they're going to be the same when we going forward to the general election. And from, you know, what I have talked to with Trump supporters, his message does come across like to those people. They listen to him. They deeply believe him. So it's probably work for him, you know, in his base. But, you know, how did this going to play out? This is not the only factor that's going to influence the general election, but it's definitely going to, you know, I, I think from my opinion that it will be, you know, the, 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 the constant thing before the election. And we, I wouldn't be surprised if we see more, you know, tough rhetoric on China. Yeah. That's true, and we only have, what, a couple more months left. Um, Kevin, give us your perspective on this. Uh, how worried should we be? Well, um, just to just to build on a point that, uh, that that Josh made, and, you know, our, our reporting, I think, uh, we've been talking to people about this issue, you know, suggests that um, there's certainly increasing concern uh, about an inadvertent start to uh, hostilities. Um, you know, especially with, I think it's three or four possibly concurrent Chinese uh, military exercises this week, and the U.S. Um, in some ways, you know, challenging uh, those with with, uh, with flyovers. Um, you know, it, uh, again, it, it, it has always, at least in you know uh, recent decades, seemed like a low probability event. But even to take uh, Josh the the estimate that. Uh, you mentioned uh, an outside analyst uh, offered if it went from one to three percent, that's a, a tripling of risk. Um, and it's it's interesting to me that um, although that's the perspective of people who are watching this closely, financial markets don't seem to have priced that in at all. And I, I don't quite know how to explain that disconnect, you know, with U.S. stocks uh, at or near record highs, you know, e e even as all of the signs on the ground point to increased risk. Okay, good. And Chujing, um, what do you do? You have a perspective on this uh, again from the U.S. sitting there in the U.S. that this is something that the um, Trump administration is, you know, uh, perhaps holding out there, uh, you know, uh, in a military sense or or raising the military stakes at all. I don't think Trump is very keen on starting a war during a pandemic and an economic crisis, but he has certainly surprised me many times before. So <laughs> there is a reason why October surprise is called October surprise. Um, meanwhile, I think Beijing is cautiously waiting and closely watching the U.S. election. The topic have toned down some of their nationalistic rhetoric, uh, blame Washington of uh, driving the latest rounds of uh, escalations intentions. Um, and that's partially true. I mean, you do see Washington as the main composer of this tit for tat symphony in the recent weeks. Um, and at the same time, I think Beijing is smart enough to know that opposition to China has been one of the few bipartisan consensus in Washington, uh, so no matter Biden or Trump will be the next US president, uh, Beijing is certainly not naive to think that uh, the US will let China off the hook. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna ask you now to put on your media criticism hats. Um, of course, uh, each of our publications is doing a fabulous job, we'll just state that for the record. <laughs> but, um, but in an overall sense, um, this is a hard kind of topic. It's a nuanced topic, it's an ever-changing topic. It requires um, a lot of knowledge, not just of foreign affairs and of these uh, particular countries and their histories, but also about technology and uh, media and uh, you know, a host of other you know, commercial applications, uh, trade. Uh, it's tough to cover. Uh, how, how are we as, uh, as media overall doing in this? And are we falling 
uh, into the you know uh, trap of uh, just trying to uh, you know trying to make sense of something um, that um, is perhaps um, you know much too nuanced to make sense of. Um, so I'm gonna we'll go kind of in reverse order here. Kevin, we'll we'll, we'll uh, start with you. Um, what what do you think about this? How how have we done this and uh, as the media overall? I think you're still muted. Apologies. Um, yeah, one sort of uh, self-reflective, I guess, or two points. I mean, I, I think uh, the kind of reporting that um, Josh described from the, gra the ground to the, the perspective of, uh, of ordinary people and businesses in this, that's an important service that we provide. Um, and at a time when headlines are moving fast, it's easy to move away from that. I think that's a, that's a risk for us. Um, I think also, uh, you know, there is there could be a temptation to to fall into easy shorthands for what's happening without really, um, in an explanatory and investigative way, uh, examining claims and trying to explicate the conflicting worldviews. Um, so I want to be on 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 watch for that as well. Um, and you know, it, it in in many ways the work we all do. Um, in this context has, has never been more important. Yeah, I think that's a good comment. We have we have a, a question here, which I'll just throw out for you to think about as you, you're all answering this. Um, somewhat of a comment and a question from Shauna Chen, who says she's a recent uh, graduate looking for opportunities to report in Asia. It's great to hear from everybody on this, but she wanted to ask uh, if, um, and, and, and which ones perhaps, um, social media outlets as avenues for reaching those on the ground stories. She mentions Tea Leaf Nation, which curates story ideas from Chinese social media platforms. So maybe you could address that and, and the uh, the answers uh, to the rest of this. Um, uh, let's go, let's, uh, at the top of the screen, on my screen at least is, uh, is our BBC correspondent. Uh, do you uh, think we've done well, as I said, um, both sides of, uh, of the uh, ocean on this, uh, what what do you see as the um, you know the the strengths of the coverage, media coverage of the U.S.-China uh, relationship uh, of of the last few months, and where can we improve? Oh, you're muted. Listen to my sorry. Okay. Um, when I'm looking for media criticism, I always turn to my cousins back in China. They're well educated. They they can read English. They are technology savvy enough to use VPN to read Western media, but they are very skeptical and cynical. They think even Western media are propaganda, and state media in China are also propaganda. So all media are propaganda in their eyes. Why do they feel that about Western coverage of China? Uh, I think they don't feel they're ever represented. Their stories are not told on international media. Um, and I think that's pretty sad. It's partially because of what Josh has described is become so difficult for uh, international media to do on the ground reporting about this um, ambivalent or human centered stories uh, about a regular Chinese people. Um, and in my reporting, I always want to tell those nuanced stories, stories that I don't see in many other um, international coverage, international media coverage about China. I recently wrote a piece about Chinese students in the US and I got this comment on Twitter that I think might be my biggest achievement in my career so far. A Chinese student said he didn't expect these nuances in my reporting from a Western media source. And that's exactly what I wanna strive for. And Nowadays, just like Kevin described, the whole world is caught in between. So you can actually cover China from anywhere. Uh, unfortunately, we still need to make arguments in a lot of uh, newsrooms that you can cover China from the US or from, from Taiwan or from Zimbabwe. Uh, I, I think that should be a given uh, sooner or later. And also, I also want to advocate for having more Chinese nationals in international newsrooms. Because it's, China is not only a topic we cover, it's our life. We live in it, or we have family or friends who, who live in it. And we do offer something unique. I, I hope this doesn't sound very self-promotional because it's not only about myself. It's about a whole group of people that I feel um, 
you know, close to, and I feel they deserve more voices and more opportunities. It's not only about language skills, but our cultural understanding, the, the network in the country, and just the social context. So, uh, Oliva and I are both members of a community called Chinese Storytellers. We're a group of journalists or uh, nonfiction content creators uh, who identify myself or ourselves as uh, Chinese. At the same time, we work primarily in English. And hopefully, by forming this uh, community, we can start to uh, channel out our voices and to really prove to international media that, look, we can do this job and we do bring something new to the table. Yeah, well, thank you for that perspective because I think, you know, and we're all also having a conversation in, in newsrooms around the world uh, on the equality issue and, and uh, diversity issue. And I think that's really important. You can't cover China without, you know, Chinese voices and Chinese storytellers. So um, I hope whoever's people who are uh, in hiring positions in newsrooms who are watching this, um, this is this is an important uh, takeaway. So thank you. And and um, well, let's go to Olivia on that on that a similar point. But you know, again, you being um, in the U.S. for a a uh, publication that speaks to a Chinese audience, uh, how does that um, you know have, from your perspective, how is the media doing both there in the U.S. Uh, and uh, and uh, publications like yours and covering this conflict. Okay, I think now we need to unmute ourselves. So um, I think I'll just, because uh, I, I wanted to echo what Johnny has said about, you know, having Chinese nationals in your new US newsroom. I think it's kind of similar for me. I was thinking if I have lived in the US longer than I do now, I probably will have a better coverage more nuanced as well than I have been doing now. So that's that works like a both ways, not just the, you know, um, not just the advocating US newsrooms having more Chinese nationals. And um, in terms of, uh, you know, what has been missing in, you know, for Chinese media covering the US, I think for the areas I have been covering on trade and tech, a very recent example is about, you know, the WeChat then a uh, potential, you know, executive executive order, and also in terms of TikTok, um, for that particular executive order, I remember on the same day or the next day, there were so many, um, you know, the social media publishing articles saying like what huge influence this this ban is actually already, you know, this sounds like it's already happening where it, you are just to not be able to use WeChat to talk to a family like in 90 days in 45 days or something actually you know it could be really bad but there are more nuances to that as well it's not just that you know in terms of like a, it's not just that you re report a more humanized story it's also in terms of like a policy policy have been more nuanced as well and if you talk to lawyers you will know like yeah it is like the language is so vague and it could have like a really big influence but we don't know yet we still have to wait until Commerce Department come up with more, uh, you know, regulations. Until that point, we will know. But it's just the kind of that kind of pattern that a lot of, uh, um, I wanted to say, I don't want to say all of them, but just some of the, you know, social media are just they're trying to maybe they just want to attract more traffic to just to make it sound like a really alarming um, before it actually happens. So I think that's one thing that 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 for us is like as a media, you have, you know, someone as Taishin, like a lot of people are looking at Taishin in Chinese language, so that it kind of gave us more burden to kind of have to clarify what it actually means. So that's something I really think, I don't know, maybe just the, you know, social media, it's all everywhere in the in the US as well. It's like, you just uh, kind of like click bit, like the highlight, you just want to attract more traffic, maybe part of the reason for that. Thanks. Uh, Josh, anything to add on this? You've, you've talked to us some about this already from your you know, um, experience. Yeah, let me unmute there. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean not, not a ton to add. I mean, I, just, I, mean, I think, I think um, 
it was interesting uh, listening to Kevin because I think a lot of this does, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of these issues kind of are most relevant at the level of editing at, at the top level of news organizations where, you know, at least in, in my news organization, I assume the same as at Reuters and, and, and the BBC, a lot of it is top down, right? And so a lot of decisions about coverage, what get, you know, what sorts of stories are prioritized and get the most resources that happens, you know, and that's, that's, those are top editors who make those decisions. Um, and I think that is, you know, the, the sort of the click, the, the drive for clicks. Um, and it just, I mean, there's a sort of general lemming like quality to journalists a lot of times, unfortunately, that really does affect um, China coverage. And I think it's just, you know, editors need to, to, to the extent there are editors out there in the, off, in the audience, you know, editors need to uh, push back uh, a little bit on that um, and, and try to carve out space for these other types of stories. I mean, journalists have always wanted to do those stories, right? It's just, um, so, so part of it is editors making that making that more possible. Um, but you know, in terms of, I mean, I, I do think the one great thing which both uh, Jowen and Olivia pointed out is there is you know a hopeful development in in China journalism now, which is that you have a whole generation of of Chinese journalists who are fluent in English and fluent in in both cultures, in, in you know, in the in the U.S. and in China or in. in the UK and China, um, which is which is a which is a new thing. I mean, there have always been a few journalists like that, but there's many, many more now. Um, and and the fact that more of the China stories outside of China means that we can use you know news organizations can can use those reporters and 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 really you know I think do some some of the stories that we've always been a little bit hamstrung in doing inside of China uh, because Chinese nationals can't work for for foreign media as as full-fledged reporters there so I think it's a real I think it's a really great opportunity um, and I'm really excited for that I think Kevin is right in the sense that there are a lot of stories to cover about what's happening with China and the world now um, and and I think we have a whole generation of, of reporters um, who, who are China savvy and who I think we can, you know, we can do a lot of good work here. Uh, um, thank you on that. So I have a question from a Hong Kong journalism student in Canada. We're very global here. And uh, the student is wondering if there's any advice on holding the Chinese government accountable uh, while reporting on topics such as Hong Kong, Uyghurs, Tibet, and at the same time avoiding narratives that may contribute to xenophobia. I think that's a really good question. How do you balance that? Um, and if you could add, if you're writing from Hong Kong, um, this is something that could, you know, get you in some, some hot water that you didn't necessarily have uh, before the national security law. So I'm going to throw that out there. Who wants who wants to take this one and, and help the student? I mean, I can I can jump in. I mean, I think I mean I think when you're reporting on on things like I mean, we've done a lot of reporting on Xinjiang at the at the Journal and on Hong Kong as well. Um, you know, I think. I, I think the only approach you can take with those sorts of stories is to just be rigorously fact-based, right? Um, and, to, and, to, and to make sure, obviously, that you're including all the context that, that is necessary for people to understand those stories. I mean, to a certain extent, you're not, you can't control how readers are going to, to interpret your stories completely, right? It's just impossible. And inevitably, any, any negative story you write about China will be exploited by people in, in, in unfair ways uh, in way, or in ways that you, that you find disturbing maybe, um, or will be dismissed by other people uh, in ways that are also disturbing. I mean, I don't, I don't think you can get, I think as a reporter, you can't get too um, wrapped up in concerns about how people are gonna interpret your stories if they're, you know, bad faith actors are going to interpret your stories. You can't worry about that. I think what you can worry about is just doing the best, most rigorous, um, most complete story possible. Um, and those stories should be done. I mean, I don't, I mean, I think these, you know, these are, these are important stories. I mean, I, I'm also sympathetic to the idea that, you know, maybe China as a whole, uh, it, you know, gets a bad rap in the media. I think that's a legitimate argument. Um, but I don't think that that means that you shouldn't be doing um, human rights stories in China. There are, uh, Zhejin wanted to uh, take uh, that question, and then I have a follow-up question for them from another um, uh, from another um, uh, questioner on our on our screen. Right. Well, that's a difficult one. <laughs> um, 
just like Josh mentioned, you can't control how your readers feel about certain article, but what you can do as a journalist is to make it factual and uh, present different sides of arguments. Um, when the Trump administration repeatedly says the Chinese Communist Party does not represent Chinese people, and uh, Chinese people should or dislike or should overthrow the Communist Party, I don't think that's accurate depiction of what Chinese people think of the party. At the same time, when Chinese state media say, oh, these two are not separatable, uh, whoever wants to separate them are daydreaming, which is also not a correct statement. Um, so I'm thinking a lot of time when we report on what the government says, probably we should provide more context, especially during this time when we can have very limited amounts of on the ground reporting about what Chinese people really think, or Chinese people will have a lot of concern when they speak to a foreign media about their feeling. I think as journalists, we can do more to kind of provide a context for our readers. Um, so uh, here's our question from Juni Lau. Um, did, and particularly from Livia and Children, have you faced any blowback as Chinese reporters are uh, reporting in the US? Livia, you wanna uh, take that? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to, to talk about the difficult side of the job. Um, because I think, you know, as a Chinese reporter, it just kind of has that assumption that kind of uh, um, that you are just, a, you know, mouthpiece or you're just a pro promoting propaganda. That one incident I had talked about is that because um, I had tried to reach out to, you know, Congress lawmakers, um, you know, on certain issues and, and never heard back from, no matter how hard I tried. Even, you know, I may go to a public event about a certain lawmaker and I asked the question, I called them and I sent, I follow up and send my, you know, my stories both Chinese and English to, to the lawmakers or to their press office. I wanted to have probably like a follow up uh, interview or something, you know, I never heard back. And later, um, you know, I always had that, you know, it's just a very, I know I shouldn't have taken it personally, but it just a kind of, you try, but all those efforts are like, gone and doesn't you know has any real um doesn't lead to any real uh, interviews or reporting and i attended a very um like a private networking events where you know an aide to a u.s lawmaker was there so i just asked him like why i never heard back and he just told me like because you are a chinese you're working for a chinese press and no one trusts chinese press so it just uh I, I guess that's probably a lot of the times um, people have on back of their mind that they probably wouldn't see uh, like say that exactly same thing to me in a professional setting. But it just uh, because that situation, he just told me very honestly, and I just uh, you know I just accepted and tried to. But I mean, I I I have to say like all the you know experts were like a lot of like actually U.S. reporters here. Like I, when I reach out to them, you know, like wanted to hear how they navigate or how they um, do their job. And they were definitely so like more than willing to help me. They, they have been tremendously helpful. Like some from Wall Street Journal, from Reuters, they may be like uh, used to be stationed in China and then they're in the US and they, you know, they know Tai and they, they were really willing to help me. I would just wanted to shout out to them as well. Us, and many of us reporting over here to think about you know, from your perspective. All right, lightning round. We only have a, like a minute and a half left. And I want to ask you all, um, especially since the summer, we talked about summer being, what should we be reading on China or on the US China relations? If you had recommendations on a book or a podcast, listening to podcast, um, what, what should it be? Let's start with you, Kevin. Solicited plug. Uh, Bill Bishop's newsletter, Sinicism. Um, read that every day. I would recommend that uh, to anyone. Yeah, I agree. Good one. Uh, Xiaojin, what, what should we read? 
Well, I have to admit, uh, I definitely spend more time on Twitter than on books these days. Uh, but a Mandarin podcast has definitely been my lifeline in this very stressful time. It's called Story FM. I highly recommend it to all the Mandarin speakers uh, if you want to hear regular Chinese people's lives, uh, not related to politics. Uh, but it's a fascinating window to look into Chinese lives. The Economy has also just published a piece about Chinese podcasts. Um, so take a look. Uh, and I'm reading former China correspondent Philip Penn's uh, book, Out of Mouse Shadow. It was published in 2008. I was a teenager in China at the time, um, of course, ob observing the country from a very different perspective. So it's it's been enjoyable to, to read the book after more than 10 years. Great, good recommendation. Olivia, what should we read? Um, I think I, I'll probably, I listen to a lot of a lot of podcasts these days as well. So I probably, there are one English and one Chinese. One English is, I probably everyone already knows, sub China. Um, I just, uh, you know, it's like a really nuanced, in-depth discussion on, you know, everything China related topics. And one Mandarin, which is not so political or not so US China, but, uh, you know, it's uh, hosted by one of the Chinese um, storyteller members called Loud Murmurs. I really love their opinions on, you know, US pop culture as, you know, three Chinese amazing uh, women that are talking about US pop cultures and their really unique perspectives. Like, it always makes me feel like, oh, why I don't have that, you know, brilliant opinions or perspectives. So like, I definitely recommend it. Great, thank you. And uh, and Josh, what's that? What, what do you listen to or read? Yeah, sure. Actually, uh, Loud Murmurs is, was on my, my list of podcasts as well to, to, to listen to. Um, I think it's I think it's brilliant. Uh, another uh, Mandarin language podcast that, I, that I've been listening to is uh, uh, it's in Chinese. It's Shandong CG, which is a, a bunch of. You're getting, um, getting uh, sorry. I'm muting myself. I, I'm I'm one of the hosts of yeah. Shandong CG. I'm right. surprised Josh knows about it. No, it's I mean it's great. I mean it's it's Chinese uh, journalists in the U.S. commenting on on U.S. news, which is a which is a perspective you just don't generally get. Uh, I think it's brilliant. So, bravo to Jelly on that one. And uh, for a book, um, uh, I've been reading Mara Vistendahl's uh, latest book. It's called The Scientist and the Spy, which really get to the heart of, of issues kind of divide one of the big issues dividing us and china which is ip theft and it's this it centers on on uh on, on chinese scientists sort of um, this case where they tried to steal um corn uh from a from a field in iowa to sort of get it uh, um the the genetically engineered corn formula uh and it's, I mean, it's really fascinating and brilliantly written and um and written with a lot of uh with kind of sympathy for, for on both sides uh, so highly recommend that. Corn in Iowa, you know, it's uh, it's campaign season, so that becomes mm -hmm. timely. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, great conversation. Thank you all, and thank you for being honest and really sharing your own experiences as well. Um, really, it's been a pleasure, and I now um, turn this back over to Juan. Thanks again. Bye. Really, it's uh, literally rotating chairs here. <laughs> thank you so much, you guys. That was a really insightful, um, really interesting conversation and uh, we obviously had a lot more questions there and wish we had more time. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things um, for us. Uh, we are, um, after each session, we invite you to join attendees in a network session in the Facebook group. These will be hosted with a theme. You are welcome to discuss anything you want. Our first network networking break focused on how to navigate a virtual and free con hosted by Joe Pan and Holly Chick, two you know, dedicated APA members who helped plan the conference. Uh, so please thank them when you're in the room. That starts in just a few minutes as soon as we end this broadcast in the Facebook group. We'll be back at 10.30 for a session on how to make compelling video that brings in money with Facebook Chiman Inc. That is happening on Blue Beans, not at, uh, not at StreamYard. So please check your email and all of the other announcements that made about that um, huge link. If you have a problem, email um, will help you out. Um, and don't forget, tonight at 7 p.m. is game night. Come play a virtual fun drawing game. All you need is your phone and be ready to laugh a lot with comedian Ryan Hynek. 
as our MC. That's it for us. Thank you for joining us for Reverse Plenary on how U.S.-China relations are shaping Asia. Thank you so much.